Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're continuing our discussion in part two of our textbook that's titled Support and Movement. And now I have cat fight behind me. And I mentioned when I started chapter seven that we were going to have three chapters that kind of went together. The bone tissue, the skeletal system, and now chapter nine, which discusses joints. Please go to page 305 in your text and try to pr print off that study guide so you can follow along. Now, once again, there is no way in the world that I can discuss everything that is in the textbook. This will only point out uh, some of the most important things that I see in the chapter and as you know, I have no control whatsoever over what is on the test. So, good luck to you. Here we go. What is a joint? A joint or an articulation, another word for it, links the bones of the skeletal system into a functional whole. W-H-O-L-E, whole. A system that supports the body, uh, permits effective movement and protects the softer organs. That's what a joint is. Okay, section 9.1, joints and their classification. As you certainly know, there are many, many different kinds of joints. Now, one of the types, one of the uh, ways of categorizing them that your, tech, that your author uses is as follows. Uh, number one is a bony joint, be joint between two bones. It is totally immobile, and this joint forms uh, when the gap between the two bones in the, in the fetal life uh, ossifies into a, basically uh, a single bone. Type two is a fibrous joint, uh, also called a synarthrosis. Um, it is a point at which adjacent bones are bound by collagen tissue, connective tissue, that emerge from one bone across the space between the bones and then penetrate into the other bone a fibrous joint. Uh, right below there, figure 9.2 shows several kinds of fibrous joints. The three subcategories are sutures, as are found in the skull. Part, uh, subheading B is gomphosis. Gomphosis, which technically is not a joint, to be honest, but it is a junction between a tooth uh, and the supporting bony structure below it, a gomphosis. And that tooth is held in there by a periodontal ligament. And third are called syndesmosis. Syndesmosis. It's a fibrous joint. Uh, where two different bones are bound by a relatively long collagenous fiber. And one that I discussed very briefly and then made a fool out of myself by not remembering the uh, problem that can come from that is the fibrous interosseous membrane between the tibia and the fibula in the lower part of the leg. If that membrane becomes inflamed, uh, such as wearing shoes that aren't properly support your legs, or walking too long on real hard surface like concrete, you can develop what is commonly called shin splints. Okay? Shin splints. There is no bone called the shin. And, but this is a common name for this inflammation, syndesmosis. Third are cartilaginous joints, also called amphithrosis. 
in these joints, two bones are actually linked by cartilage. And there are two subcategories of those. One, the symphysis is interesting uh, because two bones are joined by fibrocartilage. Um, one is the pubic symphysis. If you look at the very bottom of the picture in figure 9.4, you will see where uh, the two sides of the pubic bones are joined together by uh, cartilaginous tissue, fibrocartilage, that's called the pubic symphysis. Uh, another is the joint between two, diff two bodies of uh, vertebrae united by an intervertebral disc. Okay, now we're going to discuss probably the most complex and most familiar type of joint, section 9.2, is a synovial joint. Synovial joint is also called a diarthrosis. These are, as I mentioned, the most structurally complex uh, and are the type that are most likely to become inflamed, uh, such as with osteoarthritis or in uh, injuries on a playing field or uh, some other type of athletics. Okay, look at figure 9.5 on page 280, and you will see uh, a synovial joint that has been opened up so you can see the various parts of it. The, the, the different surfaces of the bones are covered by uh, cartilage, hyaline cartilage. And these, in order, uh, these just make it easier for the joint to function properly. In between there is also uh, a layer of fluidy tissue called uh, synovial fluid. This is all encompassed in a joint capsule. And you can see that on the far right hand side of that figure. A joint capsule surrounds the synovial joint. A knee that we'll discuss later is an example of this and is, I believe, the most complicated um, joint in our entire body. There are accessory tissues and structures that are also associated with a synovial joint. And you've heard of these before. A tendon is a strip of very tough uh, connective tissue that attaches a muscle to a bone. Boing. A muscle to a bone. Uh, tendons are often uh, very important in, in stabilizing a joint. A ligament, on the other hand, is a similar type tissue, but it attaches one bone to another. So that is the difference. A tendon goes from a muscle to a bone, and a ligament goes from one bone to another. Uh, another feature, another accessory structure is a bursa. It is a fibrous sac that is also filled with synovial fluid, and it is located between adjacent muscles, uh, usually very, very uh, proximal or pr very proximity uh, to a joint. You have heard when a bursa gets inflamed, it is called bursitis, uh, and this can be very painful. Now, I have a very intense love of physics. And if I had a blackboard with you with me, I would talk about uh, the next part, our joints and lever systems, the mechanical advantage that we can get uh, from uh, having uh, a lever system, as you can see on figure 9.7. Uh, very simply stated, if you push down at point E, of this lever, a resistance on the left-hand side can be uh, elevated. 
Now, if you move that fulcrum or you move the point where the lever touches the fulcrum back and forth, you can either lift the, re lift the load farther or you can lift a heavier load. Okay, now go, looking at page 282, uh, let's talk briefly about range of motion. Each joint is designed such that it has uh, a certain range of motion when it is functioning properly. For example, the knee can flex through an arc of 130 to 140 degrees. After I had my knee replacement, I could not go home from the hospital until I could bend my knee to at least 90 degrees. I still had a lot of therapy left to do, and now, months later, I can bend it to this entire 130 or 40 degrees. Now, what limits the range of motion? There are several things. One is the structure of the different bones that come in contact with each other. Another are the strength or the tightness of these ligaments and the joint capsules. And then the action of different muscles and tendons that act on that joint. Let's also talk very briefly about axes of rotation. Look at figure 9.10 on page 284, and there you will see uh, different types of rotation. Abduction, we, I, I learned it in medical school as abduction, is the movement of an arm or a leg away from the center line. Abduction. Ad, a deduction is then just the opposite. It is moving uh, the extremity back toward the center line. Flexion of a joint is move is making the uh, angle between the parts of the joint or the bones smaller. That is flexion. Extension is moving it back out to where you started. Okay. Now, there are six classes of synovial joints. If you look at figure 9.11 on page 285, you will see these six different types. Probably the most common are the ball and socket joints of the shoulder and the hip. The shoulder is a very unstable joint. It can be uh, dislocated very, very simply. Doesn't take very much uh, of a Prob or very much of an injury to dislocate it. Uh, there are condylar joints, and that is in the bottom on the right-hand side. You will see the other types pictured there. A hinge joint at the elbow, uh, a saddle joint. These are just, again, various shapes of the bones that are articulating with each other. Plane joints, hinge joints, pivot joints. Okay, now, I've already talked something about the movement of the synovial joints, and there you will see on page, or on figure 9.12 on page 287, flexion and extension of the arm at the elbow, flexion and extension of the wrist, and also hyperextension. Then you can have flexion and uh, hyperextension of the shoulder, uh, the knee or the hip can flex and extend also. And you would hope that as your body gets older that you are still able to move it through the complete, complete range of motion. When this gets to be a problem, 
then an orthopedist needs to get involved. And sometimes even as I've had, have to have joint replacements. I've had a hip and two knees in my legs. Okay, figure 9.13 again is abduction and adduction. 9.14 shows elevation and depression. 9.15 is protraction and retraction. Uh, 9.16 is circumduction, moving in a circle. And then medial and lateral rotation in 9.17. These rotation joints are only possible, or rotation um, movements are only possible in the shoulder and the hip. Supination and pronation. Hopefully you can see my hand. When my hand is palm up, as if I could hold a soup bowl, that is supination. Moving it down with the palm of my hand facing down or backwards here, that is pronation. Pronation, supination. And then you can see some other movements of the head and trunk. It would not surprise you that there are as many different kinds of movements as there are different <laughs> kinds of joints. I have animals that are fighting over space to be at my feet here, I think. <laughs> okay. 9.3 shows some anatomy of selected diarthroses. These I am not going to go into detail because I need you, I depend on you to go back and look at the figures, read through the text as you look at the figures. Uh, I'm not even going to mention the temporal mandibular joint other than it is between the temple and one part of the mandible. And the primary problem there is it can become quite tender. Uh, the glenohumeral joint is the shoulder joint. And there you can see it in several different views. The socket, if you will, is the acromion part of the scapula, and it is not very deep. In fact, it's rather shallow. The head of the humerus fits in that, and because the uh, the uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> because the acromion is so uh, uh, so thin and not very deep, that's why the shoulder is easy to dislocate. Now, what holds it in place? There are many different bursa. There are numerous different muscle groups that pass over the shoulder joint and hold it in place. Uh, there uh, is a set of four muscles that the very fancy terms are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. Aren't they interesting names? Uh, the tendons of all of these muscles form what I'm sure you have heard of is called the rotator cuff. And this is very important in holding the shoulder joint together. And it is an area that can be easily injured as well. The elbow joint is shown in detail in figure 9.25 on page 297. Uh, this is the joint between the humerus and the ulna, as well as the humerus and the radius. This is a little bit unique in that the ulna and radius can rotate separately than the flexion and extension. And that again is just because of the specific anatomy of the elbow joint. The, the most complex, oh, here's a picture of the hip joint, figure 9.26. That was the first replacement I had to have was my right hip. 
I had a congenital problem with my hip joint when I was about two years old. And that was a long time ago. Um, they did have x-ray, I think, but there was no way that they recognized the problem. I suffered through it with life, through my life, yet I was able to participate in all kinds of sports. But l later, as I got older, I developed severe arthritis in that hip joint. The cartilage uh, that fit between the ball and the socket was completely destroyed primarily by my uh, jogging that I took up later in life. And I had to have that joint replaced with a titanium joint when I was bare, oh, just about 50 years old. The reason I was so young was because of that uh, problem that I'd had as an in infant or an old younger child. Okay, there's the hip joint. Uh, very common, commonly fractured joint, in, especially in elderly ladies after they've developed osteoporosis. Sometimes that joint has to be replaced. Sometimes it can be fixed, uh, literally fixed back in place with a pin or rod system that goes up through the neck uh, of the uh, proximal uh, femur into the head of the bone that holds that back in place. The ankle joint is shown in figure 9.27. The right knee is shown in figure 9.28. And again, because of severe arthritis, um, my cartilage the cartilage that was between inside the joint capsule and between the distant distal femur and the tibia primarily had completely worn away and I was hardly able to walk. And now I have metal uh, knees on both sides. There's a better picture of a knee, figure 9.29. Okay, now, many, many different, this is a very complex joint and easily injured during athletics. You can see the various uh, tendons that are injured and I'm sure you've heard of these or ligaments. The ACL, the MCL, the ACL stands for the anterior cruciate ligament uh, these can be re surgically repaired through a arthroscope now. You don't have to have open surgery anymore. Um, but they take a lot of rehabilitation before an athlete can go back onto the uh, field. Okay, that's the end of the chapter nine on joints. Again, when time comes for the test, I just want you to have heard of these joints, heard of the different subcategories of the joints, uh, and try your best. There are several tables in the text that list examples of the certain joints. And I'm sure that in our test bank, at some point you will uh, be asked, for example, which of the following uh, joints is a type of, well, ball and socket joint, and they'll list three or four, and you have to pick out either the shoulder joint or the hip joint. Might not be that simple, uh, but those are the kind of things that you need to do uh, to study for chapter nine. Chapter 10 comes up, and then we start a couple, three chapters in the muscular system. Uh, thank you for your attention here, and we will get started with Chapter 10 later again this week. Thank you.